what I do, I go out and reach the general public every day. Go out to the people that are out there sick and suffering. Um, I go to the transit areas. Uh, interact with those folks, offer them free HIV testing, I give them literature, I also pass out condoms, Right. free right. condoms. Yeah. A lot of things that we do here at One Day at a Time are free services to the general public. Okay. Other places you'd have to pay for those services, so we offer great service to the city of Philadelphia right. and the surrounding community, right. whereas we offer free HIV testing. We test here every Wednesday right. between 10 and 2, but if someone were to come in, we would offer them that service. We wouldn't turn them away and tell them you have to come, we come back on Wednesdays. Okay. And then with my street outreach, I go out and bring people in. Okay. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I usually hit the streets at about 10 a.m. Yeah. It's been about an hour, half, two hours out, just getting the information out to people. Okay, so I'm, I'm in a crack house now, and you come and you, and you, and you see mm -hmm. me there. What would you tell me? Um, first of all, I ask you, can I, can I take up a couple of minutes of your time? Right. First you ask permission. I ask permission. I just don't go in because you're invading someone's personal space. So I have to respect that personal space. So first I'll ask them, is it okay if I come in and pass out some free literature, free condoms, free information for some of you folks, if you want it. Um, what Another thing that we do is offer free, free um, initiatives like $5 write of gift cards, free gifts to bring folks in. Sometimes you have to have a little bit, like you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink, that kind of a concept. True. But if you offer something to them, yeah. it might make them feel more um, willing to come in and okay. take advantage of the services that we offer here at One Day at a Time. How do you instigate hope in them? What, what do you tell them? That, that um, I, like myself, I myself at one time in my life was down on my luck. Um, but there is hope. You could take a look at me, for instance, and a lot of the people that I work with and see that there is hope that sometimes you have to reach the bottom rung on the ladder to be able to climb up and appreciate the steps that you have to take to climb up. Um, I always tell them that the harder the climb, the more you'll respect the change in your life. I always preach the five stages of psychological change. Which are? Which are pre-contemplation, that's when you're not even thinking about changing your life. Mm -hmm. You're too busy, you got other things going on. And then when you, when you reach that contemplative stage, mm -hmm. you're actually forming thoughts in your head that I want to change my life. Something has to get better. Mm -hmm. In order for it to get better, who has to take responsibility? You have to take responsibility yourself. Mm -hmm. So after the second stage, which is contemplation, the next stage is preparation. Mm -hmm. You want to prepare your steps. After the preparation stage, you want to get into the action. Put that plan in action. And then the final, which is most important, the maintaining of that lifestyle change. And, and the maintaining is the big uh, that's change that's That's the big challenge, happened. yeah. Yeah, what happens, a lot of folks, they reach the action plan and they think it's all over. Yes. What it is, it's a change of your life altogether. Yes. Um, so the maintenance part of it, you're at the end, but that can be the hardest sometimes, to maintain that change. Sometimes it might change, it might take changing the route that you usually travel. Yes. Because things like um, places, scents, I mean it's unbelievable some of the things that can trigger someone back into drug use, back into unprotected sex. Mm. For, you know, because a lot of times we come, we work with a lot of street workers, mm. a lot of people that sell sex for drugs and money. So we want to reach them also. Yeah. I just had some sad news this morning as somebody who had a heart attack and was, uh, you know, as a, a consequence of his drinking was, uh, yes. and I thought he'd got hold of it, mm -hmm. uh, had relapsed again this weekend. Mm, and, sorry uh, to hear that. It's, it's mm -hmm. so sad, isn't it? Yes, it is. And yes, it's it is. to do with this ongoing maintenance. You, we have to mm -hmm. the maintenance continually part is the most grow. Right, because sometimes you're in that maintenance part, you get a little, like I say, sometimes you get a little cocky. Yes. You think, I've got this, you know, I've been yes. doing this for six months now, a year. Some yeah. of the most vulnerable people and the most dangerous ones yeah. to relapse are people that have been in recovery for three, four, five years or more. Yes. Uh, a guy used to tell me that uh, what, what gets people drinking and drugging again quite mm -hmm. often is that thought, I'm special and different. We, we only always one. With, yeah. I'm only going to have one. Yeah. One well, they, 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 nobody else, uh, everybody else can't drink. I mean, they're powerless over right. alcohol. Exactly. But I might be the exception. I, I might be able to get away. Right. We all think we're the exception exception and we're not and that's the scary part of it all a pleasure to talk to you oh it's my pleasure yeah, thank you what this actually is is a homeless shelter for men right um it's 30 bed 30 bed facility and it's broken down you have a dry site and a wet site what we mean by wet and dry the difference is dry is homeless men who have long histories of being homeless.
but don't use drugs. Then you have downstairs a uh, history of homeless men who have long histories with the city of Philadelphia, who's been homeless for long periods of time, like over 10 years or more, who are actively drug users. Right. So we separate the two. Uh, our process is to try to convince those that's in the wet site to, you know, get into treatment, start doing some things so we can move them to the dry site. And those in the dry site, they have uh, all kind of programs, housing, all set up on. We have on-site case manager, you know, that helps them and proceed on and in getting into their own home. Correct. You know what I mean? So that's the difference yeah. in the two facilities. And there is also funded by the city, which they come, they decide who comes here. Okay. You know, it's not a walk-in. You have to be referred through the city to be able to come to the shelter. Seth is the case manager who uh, clients can come to to get them set up for medication, appointments, uh, you know, if they're ready for their housing. You know, he, he's a great assistance to this facility so he gets them prepared to move on. You're in charge of uh, catering? Uh, yes, the food service department. Oh, yeah. Right. Um, they get three meals a day plus snacks. Um, I'll try to mix it up a little bit, give them a little bit of... You, you, you decide on the menu? Yes. Okay. I try to set my menus for on an every two week basis. Right. And I follow that same I follow that same menu for two weeks. Right. And then I switch it up. Okay. I try to make sure that they have a meat upholstery at the start. Do, do, are they complimentary? Do they say you have good food? Yes. Yeah. They love the food. <laughs> they do love the food. No, is that because you put another ingredient in? Uh, yeah, I try to put a little love in. <laughs> I try to put a little love in. Makes all the difference, doesn't it? Yes it does. Yes it does.